Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and today I'm so excited to be here with Tammy Dumirza again. Tammy is a sought-after spiritual teacher. She's the author of The Inmate and The Medium. She is a medium. She is a relationship expert, and she's called the Freedom Alchemist because she's teaching people and her clients how to let go of limiting beliefs so they can start to live love-infused lives. She's also one of our masterclass teachers in Wisdom from North membership, where she is teaching the class how to get off the hamster wheel of avoidance and thrive. Now, let's meet Tammy. Hello, Tammy. A warm welcome. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you. It's really an honor for me also to have you as one of our masterclass teachers and you just made a beautiful class for our members and uh, today I would love to go all sorts of places but I want to start with uh, our curriculum as souls because you're saying in the master class that we have a certain curriculum that we're here to master uh, and we have the capacity to master it, but often we have to experience sort of the opposite of what we're going to master. So can you take us, I know you're a medium, I know you can see things. So can you take us through sort of how you see this whole process with us um, getting this curriculum? Like, how do we get it? Do we decide? Is it our team on the other side that decides? Like, how is this happening? It's really a collaborative thing. Um, and I have actually, what happened was years ago, whenever I need to know something, the universe, God, you know, love, energy, whatever you want to call it, wants me to learn something, I'll go through a series of the same clients with the same kind of information until I get it. And then that's just added to my tool chest. So years ago, I started understanding, I started seeing like conference rooms, um, and some of them would be in caves and some of them would be in a little conference room. And I would read the contracts that we sign. And we choose our bodies, our hair. I don't know why we as women complain so much about our bodies. And when somebody says something to me, you're petite, you can grow fingernails, your skin is good. I say, well, and the last uh, lifetime I was obese. And the one before that, I was a prostitute. So what are you gonna say? I chose this, you chose this. We get hung up on those tangibles that we're not here to pay attention to. So what I started recognizing was that we are here with a certain curriculum and we are going to be put in that curriculum over and over and over again. And we're the ones that designed it, not just by ourselves, but with our teams, our gods, our teachers, master teachers, love energy, the universe, God, source, whatever you want to call it, we collaborated and we're upset that we're here. So imagine if we took that knowledge that you came here to accomplish a certain level of growth and you just go into that. And when you go into it, you accomplish it. I will tell you that the benefit of going into it and going through the suffering and the pain and everything that brings that up for you in front of you to see um, is worth it because here's the good news. Once you overcome a specific aspect of your curriculum, then you will no longer have that symptom ever again in your life. So imagine instead of being upset that you're here, instead of me working with people where they're really not wanting to be present, they're checked out, which is actually called an experiential avoidance, where you are checking out of your life. Imagine if you turned and you faced it and you said, bring it, I'm walking through you. I'm going to use this. You go from a disempowered state to an empowered state by understanding this is not happenstance. This is not random. This is on purpose. 
I'm going to use it. It's a gift. Then you start to look at your entire life as an opportunity and you understand that we're going to experience both dichotomies of good, bad, right, wrong, health, sickness. I'm not surprised. I'll just go, okay, if I'm sick, it's a symptom of something that is in my emotional realm. I'm going to use it to heal. And then I don't have that symptom anymore. So it's fascinating that we don't know we designed it. So when I started being educated, I was literally reading the contract and seeing the person's signature. And I was privy to the information and how they were saying, are you sure you want this level of intelligence? Do we need to add humor to you because you're going to need laughter to get through this? You know, every single bit of your personality, every single way that you assimilate information was all planned in that curriculum. Every single thing that you could possibly be asked to go through or find yourself going through, you already have the tools inside to overcome it. So what if you took that abridgment, you crossed the bridge and you went, I'm going to use this and I'm going to get it. And then you're free from that curriculum and people don't behave the same way and you don't have the same pain. And I did this when I overcame homelessness and I kept getting to the edge of the cliff, Yaneki, and I was, I was feeling like I'm gonna be homeless again. I've gotten furniture, I've gotten towels, I've gotten sheets, I've got a lamp now, but I was financially in trouble. And I finally said to God, to source one day, I wanna overcome this once and for all. That was six years ago this August and never ever have I been even close. What if you could do that? What if you could overcome the things that hurt you the most and you don't have to suffer with that anymore because you're using it? Yeah, you have a, a really um, powerful story. Uh, you've overcome so much. And I think that's why I love working with you also because I know you've been through the transformation and then it's easier for others also to believe that they can uh, move through the same transformation. Uh, did you, I, I get curious, did you actually see that contract? Do you see it through your third eye? It, are you uh, are you visual or I didn't quite get like how you got the information? Um, for me personally, I know that if you read about mediums and they have a tendency to, to be proficient in one of the Claire's, clairvoyant seeing or clairaudient, which is actually behind here, behind the ears, or, you know, feeling it, extrasensory, sentience, um, or smelling or tasting. I actually know a massage therapist that tastes, and I know that she's responding to something releasing from my body because she has that ability. In my case, I don't know why, but all five of those get activated and I cannot smell in the physical realm. But when I need to smell during a session working with the client, I will smell and I will also be told this is violet or this is a cigar that her grandfather used to smell or whatever. So what we do is we don't realize that we kind of handpick these things that we need. For me, I see it. Now I'm gonna tell you a cute story because you know, those of us that are in this spiritual realm and we're working with clients and we're doing our best, you know, and we're not perfect and we are learning as we're sitting in front of you, we're learning with you as our clients. Most of the teachings that I've gained has been because I did sessions and I would get these truths and I'll go, oh, I want the next client because I just learned something profound. Well, I was sitting there when I first started doing sessions I would not open my eyes because I would see the masters and the teachers and the other person's guides. And I was scared to open my eyes because I thought, if you open your eyes, you're not gonna see this anymore. And I heard that is stupid. Just open your eyes and test it and see. So even for me doing this for you know 30 years, really since I was 11 and I'm 61, doing this all my life, I've been using these abilities but when you really get serious about using them 
you start to question yourself. So when I started opening my, my eyes, I realized that the third eye was active even in that scenario. I don't have to close my eyes. I don't have to concentrate. I can go in people's lives. I can backtrack when they're five years old and stand in the kitchen and tell them the conversation that they had with their mother and what it did to them with relationships. I can go back in time and see a kindergartner and how that makes her not live in color because a bully was giving her a neutral crayon for five months and three days. I mean, it's nuts. So I hear, I smell when I need to, I taste, which is Claire Gustin's, and I see. And when I see, this is the thing people get caught up in. And I have a little five senses class that's really inexpensive on my website. It's a master class. And I'm talking about the five senses and what you do with them. People think that if I don't visually see a whole figure, then I'm not seeing. But seeing in real life is clairvoyance seeing how people are behaving, seeing what's going on, even having that ability to pay attention to, wow, she just had a really strong response or wow, she just closed her arms. She just closed herself off. That's clairvoyance too. And we're negating ourselves thinking, oh, well, if Tammy sees the whole thing or the whole scene, then I'm not really doing that well, or maybe I don't have that ability, but I will tell you, sometimes I see just a head. Sometimes I see a picture. Sometimes I see the outline. Sometimes it's just energy and I'm reading the energy. So there is no right or wrong or valid or invalid because if we just sit as I do, very, very unattached, as an innocent kid going, what does my client need? What do they need? Then I don't have a judgment as to what comes through, what doesn't, what's right, what the timing is, whether or not this person should be here or not. It's fascinating in that way, but I had to mature and learn that. Thank you for explaining that. Um... Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about death lately. Uh, I know you lost someone and I also lost an old friend of mine and it has just touched me deeply. Uh, and I, I speak to him, but feel he's there, but then he's not there. And uh, uh, it must be uh, a comfort to have that ability to be able to speak uh, to, or communicate with those in the afterlife. Uh, has it helped your life? Uh, to have these abilities, like I, I can just imagine like getting answered to so many questions, like that's what we want, right? Well, it's interesting that you say that. So I'm gonna give you and everyone that is tuning in something very profound. When suddenly you think of a loved one or a friend, they're actually visiting you. Oh. <laughs> Every time. Then he's visiting me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's visiting you a lot. We discredit ourselves. We're, we're not realizing that, oh, this is really happening. And so I have, I have this picture that a friend gave me that says she believes she could, so she did. If you believe and you now know from a medium, who knows that when suddenly Someone comes up, how many times have you been out and you're thinking about somebody and then they suddenly call you or they have emailed you when you get home or there's a letter from them or a thank you note or something, same thing. We're all energetic beings and we're reading energy. So when you're discrediting yourself and not really thinking, well, because I'm not a medium and I'm not doing this for a living that I'm not really seeing, but he's visiting you. So I'm gonna give you an example of that. When my niece was murdered in December, I'm sitting in St. Lucia and I am having dinner and it's 8.30 at night. And the time difference in the States was when she died. And suddenly I'm looking at Tony J. Salimi and my niece pops in right here. She's not saying anything. It was like, she couldn't speak. And I'm like, Sarah, what are you doing? I'm not saying this out loud. 
But I have learned that if I see or feel or sense or remember somebody, they're visiting, so I do talk to them. Because like I said, there's different forms of experiencing different things. And then two, you're dealing with the energy of where they are. My niece was very traumatized, so she wasn't speaking. So, but I'm noticing you're here. Why are you popping in? Why are you popping in? She lingered the entire dinner. She's not speaking. And then all night long, every single time I woke up, Sarah would come to mind and I would have memories of a ring that I gave her or something like that, suddenly having these memories. And then at 530, I noticed a text from my sister, her mother, and she said, Sarah was murdered. And I was like, no, no. And then I realized why Sarah was hanging out. She wanted me to know. She's still not speaking to me. I don't know if you know Sylvia Brown. Yeah, I've heard of her. about this a little bit, how sometimes they can't speak. Sometimes they're not ready to present themselves. Sometimes they're getting their own healing. Sometimes it's, you know, even for people like me that have that ability and are cognizant of it and embrace it. We know it. So you're having the ability and you're not embracing it until I get you that aha moment, you know, and now you're like, oh gosh, what do I say to him? The next time that he comes, talk to them. And sometimes I'll say, would you stop visiting me so much? I've got work to do. <laughs> you can actually control it or you can call them forward. Yeah, it's really strange because I, I dated him like 20 years ago. So, and so I don't understand why I had such a big grief over this guy. But but it was when I was in my most vulnerable uh, place. It was the happiest year ever. And I think it just, he touched my heart. And when I heard that he had um, passed, I grieved for a week every yeah. day for a person I hadn't seen in nine years. It was really strange. I thought I was a bit crazy, but I know I'm an emotional person. So I was just, okay, okay. There's something here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it is, I usually talk to them and say things to them. I remember this about you. I, and in this case, I'm asking Sarah, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? How do you want to be remembered? I don't want to, re to be remembered as a nine month pregnant with Isabella female that was a victim of PTSD and drugs and alcohol. I want her life to matter. So I can tell that she's kind of hanging out. And I can tell that when something is going on with Callie, her three year old, she kind of comes near, but she's still not speaking. But I'm not upset. I'm not traumatized by it. I'm just, I see you. And let me tell you what my perception is of what's going on. If there's something for me to do, then I'll ask her, is there something for me to do? And then all of a sudden I'll get a call from Rolling Stones who's doing an article, or I'll get a call from CBS Investigative News that is doing an article and I'll be asked to do an interview. So you're saying that the, the, this is happening from the other side, really? she she's doing things people will do things for you there was one it's really funny but when i first realized that i could actually communicate i was used to communicating with gods and teachers and masters and jesus and god and you know these people that i was seeing coming forward i didn't know that i could communicate with people who crossed over so when that first started happening to me, I went to people, I went to the chiropractor where I'd have spiritual conversations with some of the, you know, the staff and I'd say, Hey, do you want a free reading? I don't, I think I can talk to dead people, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm not going to charge you. And what would happen is they would come in and this one woman, I said, wow, wow, wow. You're a great grandfather who you never met did something for you. And she's like, what? Why would he do something for me? And I said, do you remember the concert where you didn't have tickets and you're outside the concert and all of a sudden two tickets appeared and they're VIP tickets? She's starting to bawl. She is crying her eyes out. That happened to me. And I said, that was your great, great grandfather that you never met. He's been with you, watching over you 
protecting you, giving you gifts. Yeah, they do things. They move doors. They pennies is the most common way that, that for some reason they can move copper. They can actually leave voicemails. They can open and shut doors, turn TVs on and off, electronics they play with. They, they're doing things on the other side for us too. And I've had my grandmother tell me, I see you, you can get through this. When I was homeless, you can get through this. And I'm like, well, you weren't here for me while I was, while you were alive, but thank you for being here now. There's a lot going on we don't know. Oh yeah, I think I, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we can start to understand uh, how it works. Uh, so your niece, um, is it a point where you're going to help her into the light? Uh, that seems to be the work that mediums are doing, helping them into the light? Or, or is it okay that she's hanging around, if you know my question? Because I'm wondering about souls that might be, you know, a bit earthbound and stay there for a long time if they don't let go right well there's a difference in what we call entities you're considered an entity because you're an energetic being but what we think of entities is people that are malevolent or you know don't they're stuck or you know they can't move through it kind of like patrick swayze on the movie ghost you know just kind of stuck they will hang out for a specific purpose and when you think about the fact that Sarah's three-year-old daughter saw her murdered. You can imagine why Sarah would kind of hang out, you know? And I told you before we started this, I know Sarah did something with Callie to get the custody in the hands of where Callie wanted to be contractually. See, when you have a contract to experience a certain thing, I look at Callie as a three-year-old with her in person and I go, wow, you're so brave. I see your curriculum. You came in to a mother and a father and he was going to murder your mother in front of you. Wow, what kind of abilities do you have? What did you come here to accomplish? What message are you going to give the world? You know, so I find no fault with people hanging out I find no judgment to tell them, go to the light. Now I do teach mediums how to help people go to the light. And I speak to these beings as if they're fully clothed right in front of me. I'm very respectful. And I ask them what choice they want to make. And then I help them to do that process. What is beautiful is that whoever I am with as a client, they will usually see, I will pray and ask that their mind is open so that they can see the person traveling through the tunnel to the light and they can tell me what's happening. If it's in the house, if it's in, you know, if I'm, I'm across the world and it's on the phone or whatever, time space is not governed by spirit. Spirit is unconfined. So when I ask, let this client see it, they will. It's wild. You know, I had a, a totally different plan with this interview, uh, but sometimes, uh, or I actually, I work very organically. So I let myself be inspired in the moment. And this was apparently what was going, what we were going to speak about. Um, and I think, especially now when, you know, people are going through COVID-19 and losing so many people, I think it is an important message. Uh, to know that we do continue and that our loved ones who we are afraid of will get sick and etc that we can actually communicate with them and I think it was so profound what you said that when you're thinking about the person that person is actually visiting you I'm going to keep that in my heart <laughs> thank you I want to go back to sorry I said it's a comfort yeah to know that, that is actually what's happening it's not haphazard Right. It's really happening. So use it, communicate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, give ourselves that credit, you know, that I, I have this ability or yeah, uh, something about that. Uh, back to the curriculum. 
can we change the curriculum? I've interviewed some uh, teachers who are uh, teaching reincarnation and uh, the in-between lives that have been hypnotizing um, patients uh, and said that some of these patients uh, or what came forward was that some of these patients say when they're hypnotized that I took on too much. So is it possible to change our curriculum? So let's say, you know, we're going through a lot of tough things uh, and sometimes it feels unbearable, right? Like, like people do commit suicide. And I've been wondering about that. Like, okay, some are saying that you, you never get more than you can handle, but that doesn't seem like to be true because people do commit suicide. Yeah. So I'm wondering about that. Can we change the curriculum if we feel this is too much? I can't handle it. Yes. Okay. Within, within one second. And you can choose what thing you want to overcome in this life and what you don't. But only somebody who's aware that you have that is empowered to do it. Because if you don't know that you can do it, if you don't know that you can say, and I teach people with pain in their body is a good example. When the pain in their body is showing them the symptom and we are working on the journey to healing, which sometimes there's layers to that, I will teach them how to address the pain body and say, okay, thank you. I've got it back off. I can't handle that much pain. The pain subsides, but the client knows to keep going with the curriculum. And I can almost tell them exactly how long the pain is going to be gone and when it's gonna come back and for what purpose. And I had a cancer client that I was working with in the Santa Barbara area of California and I was flying to him and he was in a great amount of pain. And I just put my hand, my hands heating up, just talking about this, the, the energy comes from the palm. I put my hand over his knee, like his knee is here. I just put it over it. I didn't even touch it. And I said, what memory popped up? And he went, this memory of something that I did wrong to somebody. And I went, let's get it out. Let's, let's expose it. Let's ask that person for forgiveness. That's what's weird that most people don't know is that even though you may have a loved one or somebody that really hurts you that is living, they will actually come and show themselves whether they have transitioned or whether they're alive. I can see them and I can describe them for my clients and say, okay, this woman just came in. She dresses like this. She's got on an apron. She's pointing to the apron and they'll go, wait a minute, that's my mother and she's alive. And I'm like, yeah, well, she's here to do some spiritual business. Let's get through it. With him, I told him that day, I said, you've been in excruciating pain before I came. I let him go half of the day because I needed him to shift in order to just be open because he was so angry that I asked God, what do I do to get this guy to shift? It came up, that shift was amazing. Then I just put my hand over his knee, a memory came up and I said, okay, you're not gonna have any more pain until nine o'clock in the morning when you come to pick me up. Because for the next three days, I'm simply gonna put my hand over your knee because it's gonna be hurting. And every time I do, the pain's gonna leave, 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 leave. This lends itself again to that concept that when we're really using what is rising for us, whether it is physical pain or emotional pain, there's an opportunity to heal it. When we're using whatever that is arising in the moment. Yes. Okay. It's an opportunity for you to heal. That is so empowering rather than I'm a victim. Why is this happening to me? Why is my body in so much pain? I have a client right now that has blood cancer and it's not growing and they don't know what to do with her because we're working on her healing, but there were layers to that pain. And she has learned because of the techniques that I've given her how to get rid of the pain and yet still do the journey. So the pain only, it's, it's kind of like I can feel her, 
all of a sudden her face will appear and I'll talk to her and say, do the technique that I taught you that is really private. That's what's unique. I don't have postage stamp in a box techniques because spirit is assimilating all of the information about you, how you think, whether or not you have a sense of humor, every single person you've ever met, every single joke you've ever heard, every single color that has excited you. It's using all of that information and from all lifetimes to give you your own personal technique for healing. Wow, that was interesting. Uh, and that's also sort of a problem because when it's not one size fits all, because then it's not just to take a course and then it's fine, you know? <laughs> well, there are some things that are generic, but when it comes to really working privately with people, which is the thing that I love the most, that's when I see the biggest jump mm. is when they're in private sessions and specifically in my three to five day program, which somebody hired me for 13 days. I was in their home for 13 days and life changing. When I'm in a concentrated effort like that with somebody, it's much more powerful than a one hour session. Hmm. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Um, back to avoidance, um, which was the beginning of sort of the conversation because you made a masterclass for our members about it. And I thought it was such an important topic. I was very happy you addressed it because I think it's something that we don't want to look into because we're avoiding it. You know, we're avoiding it because we don't want to go into it. So, uh, but it is important. How do we know when we are avoiding things in ourselves? Um, and I actually think this is very important when it comes to spiritual work because a lot of spiritual practitioners, um, people who um, have been on the you know, spiritual journey for a long time, they're very conscious, they're practicing. At the same time, they feel stuck. I have all these techniques, I do all this work, I meditate, but I feel stuck. Why don't I have that partnership? Why don't, don't I have that success that I long for? I'm, do, I'm being of service. And I think it might have something to do with avoidance or resistance. It is. But yeah. It really is. Um, the thing that I would say is that the thing that you want actually wants you. Wow. I want you to think about that. The thing that you want is connected to heart energy, is connected to your curriculum. And it wants you as much as you want it. If you just had that powerful change of thought process, you know, then you would be crossing over to obtaining it. We get so worried. There's a really good thing that I'm writing in my book right now. Um, stop clarifying, stop, you know, running and start clarifying and get the relationship that you want. Every single thing in this life is a relationship, your relationship to money, your relationship to love, your relationship to your clothes, your relationship to food. Everything is a relationship. So stop running. What happens for people like us that are constantly, you know, you feel this, and I know your audience feels this, that you, you know something's missing, but you don't know what it is. But you inherently know something, I'm, I'm missing something, there's a void, or you're constantly thinking about that which is missing, like a mate or money or whatever it is. When you're focusing on that, you're not moving forward, you're in resistance. When what I do with my clients is to get them to identify, to change the focus onto what it is they're wanting, and then they automatically start shifting in movement. And then all of a sudden they have a job interview and they're out of a job. One of the things that happened, um, talking about avoidance and how to pull this in, is I'm writing about this in the book about one of my clients just days ago, who she was, a. I told her, I said, I'm feeling that you, you, it would be beneficial for you to schedule your mentoring sooner rather than next week. And so she's learned that when I say that, uh oh, something's coming up, let's go ahead and do it. And I ask her, are you excited about your interview? 
And she said, what sounds spiritual, well, I'm trying not to be in resistance, so I'm not being attached to what happens. And I went, yeah, for a normal person, that would actually be okay, but really you're in avoidance. You don't wanna feel, why would you not be excited over the interview? Where is that fine line, Kineki, of feeling something and being spiritual and feeling it, you know, and then using it? That is such a mastery level. And you know what? She got excited over the interview and she's had three more with the same company. So it's coming to a close. And she was in resistance by avoiding, by keeping herself safe, a kind of protective avoidism, avoidance behavior, where she was thinking, I can't get excited because if I get excited, then I'm going to be disappointed and I can't deal with the disappointment. So the other thing that I would say, and this is a little bit, it adds to this, but it's a facet of it. And it looks like I'm changing the subject, but I'm not. Whenever you feel something's off or why can't I get through this or I'm in pain, then it's actually the conspiracy. There's a conspiracy going on at all times to show you you're not there. You haven't got it. You're not in alignment. You're not receiving it because when you cross over from fear energy to love energy, miracles happen and they happen immediately. So if you just stopped and acknowledged, I'm feeling stuck. Oh my goodness. Tammy says that that's my team saying, we want to give you a new level of growth. You know what I would tell my clients to do? Say yes or no. Formally answer that feeling of feeling stuck, move to an empowered place and say, yes, I want that next part of my curriculum. Did you know that would change your reality? And movement starts. We get afraid and believe me, when new abilities would just pop in for me, when I'm in session, I would get afraid. Okay, great. Now, what does that mean? And how is that going to change my life? And what are you going to require of me? And how much more of a freak am I going to be? <laughs> Instead of just embracing and going, okay, I trust the process. And if it's coming to me, I must have earned it because that's really what happens. And then just go into that knowing you can trust that you're loved. And when you're loved, love is good for you and it's good for all. Did that answer you? I hope. Yeah, there's so many things about this and it's so fascinating. And I, I was just trying to really be present with what you said. Uh, so to sum up, um, meeting that uh, sort of meeting the challenge, seeing that this is happening for you. Uh, also having a focus on what you want to create, not what you don't have. Yes. Yeah. What do you want and why do you want it? Which helps me to get my clients into the heart energy. When I get the client into the heart energy, which is connected to spirit, then they start changing their reality because their focus moves from that which I don't have to where do I want to go? And one of the coping mechanisms that I see so strongly is I'm going to replace, I'm going to have a diversion I'm going to find something else to do to get myself busy instead of facing the fact that I'm in pain. Which is avoidance yeah. again. Yeah. It's a type of avoidance. You know, you're, you're replacing, there's a substitution avoidance that I talk about in your masterclass. Yeah. Substituting something else. Right. It, it, it's interesting. I was noticing while I was editing it that, uh, it like touched me and hit me and, uh, I was definitely feeling I was growing while I was editing that class. That's a uh, really good sign. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> yeah, um, especially moving into work, uh, avoiding and uh, actually being open for uh, a relationship it has been my thing. Because <laughs> uh, it's just, I love working with what I'm doing. 
uh, at the same time, I know that I am avoiding something else, uh, but I haven't pinpointed why uh, that is my <laughs> process. What, what am, uh, so yeah, do you have any tip on how you can discover that, so you understand that, okay, I'm avoiding this, um, whatever it is. How can we discover why we are avoiding it? We're avoiding it because we don't know how to get it because we don't have the answers. It's very simple. All right. The reason that people don't change their lives is first of all, they're avoiding facing their lives. If you face it and you just say, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to find it. And I'm gonna give you a technique that I used when I was moving to North Carolina. And my daughter told me that I couldn't stay with her but six weeks. And I'm like, you know what? You knew I didn't wanna stay with her. So moving in six weeks doesn't make sense. So I just got in front of my computer and I said, okay, higher self, you already know where I'm moving. You knew that I really didn't want to move in with my daughter, even for a few months to establish my business from Florida to North Carolina. This is, this is recovering from homelessness. This is the process and the journey of overcoming it. I still didn't have much money, but I didn't really want to be there. So when my daughter came and said, mom, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, we promised. And I'm like, no, 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 this is good. So I said, okay, higher self, you knew I didn't wanna be there and you already know where I'm moving. So by an act of my will, I connect with where that is. I'm gonna push back up to my desk and say, show me where to go. Go to Craigslist, don't go to a real estate agent, go to a Craigslist. Scroll, scroll, scroll there, right there. Not very many pictures. I applied for that place to live, not knowing how I was going to pay for it or what it even looked like inside. And it was beautiful and I loved it. And it was a respite. And that's where I overcame the fear and the financial issues that I had had most of my life and have not had since by starting to trust is that what you're saying by starting to trust your guidance with your spirit and knowing that the non-physical which includes your spiritual self already has the answer yeah i love that what you said that my higher self already know where i'm going like that perspective that that the answer is already there like yes. the relationship is there, the job is there, the path is there. I, I love that. Uh, at the same time, it confuses me when I think about quantum physics and all sorts of timelines. <laughs> I know, that's, I don't know how all of that fits together. I haven't merged that yet. I do understand the concept and I believe in it, but I don't know how to assimilate all of that. It's like going from Christianity to spiritual law you know, and then finding out that hell wasn't even mentioned until the 1300s. And wait a minute, I got to retrain my brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a profound uh, conversation. I always love speaking with you. Uh, it feels like there's an ocean of knowledge that, uh, that you have, and we could go through all sorts of creeks and places. Um, I would like to end by asking you, what are you working on now? I know you have books coming out. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is I'm writing a series of seven books about relationships and all of the different facets of the relationships. I'm specifically writing to women and I am dealing with the power of the VJJ to... <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Your avoidance behavior, not realizing that you're lonely, even in a marriage is predominantly written to single women. And I'm actually writing it to one of my clients and she knows it. She knows who she is. And I'm writing it to her as if I'm sitting in a room with her and I'm writing and I'm giving all this information. Women do not realize that men really need instruction. And if you don't understand the neural pathways in the brain and you don't understand uh, testosterone versus dopamine and what women expect men to do, we really expect 
more out of them than what they are built to do. And if you understand that and you learn how to instruct, not change, not manipulate, but give instructions based on what you want, what you feel, and then they get to choose whether or not they're going to meet that need. Because you're, as, as a female, we predominantly work in dopamine and we're assimilating a thousand things at one time. There's even jokes made about a woman's brain and a man's brain and how that functions. These are some of the things I'm teaching and teaching women don't expect him to do that. Women have a tendency to test men and then they get upset because they failed the test. And I'm like, why did you set up that test that you knew they would fail? It's psychology. So I'm writing these books to women to help women to understand how to step into their power and also present what they want to the man. And for me, if, it, if a guy fits, I'm doing a lot of dating. I could tell you the wildest story from a date last night. I am learning last so night. <laughs> yes, last night. I've never seen this before never ever seen this before this guy is kind of aggressive at times he noticed a person he's like well that person was expensive i didn't tell him that i bought it used <laughs> i'm like what is your problem with my purse you know and then suddenly in the middle of the meal he he was talking about cutting his hair in the hotel room and then he said something about we were talking about the vegetables and how good the food was. And he said, yeah, and I manscaped myself. And I, I would just jump and go, what? And I said, that was so inappropriate. Why did, you know, he was doing sexual things like that. Like when we were walking out of the restaurant, I'm like, gosh, this breeze feels so good. I love the air in my face. And he said, yeah, I'm picturing you walking naked with it. And I, I'm shaking again. And I turned around, looked at him and said, what? I said, you know what? I think you have Tourette's. I think you have a new term that I'm going to give you called sexual Tourette's because you just burst out with the inappropriate things. That was my date last night. I'm finding humor and I will write about this and tell women, don't be so afraid. Don't be so insecure. Know yourself. Then you'll know when the match is right. Mm. Know your values, know what turns you on, know what you're passionate about, know what your needs are. Then you can share with the man, because I want to tell you something I've learned. Most men, really, the good ones, the ones that aren't so damaged, want to please the woman. So what if women, through my books, this book of seven series, what if women learned how to treat themselves? And then they could share it with him and either he does it or he doesn't. And if he doesn't next, we're just not a fit. Isn't that wild? Yes. So, and I can't um, wait for that book series. That is going to be powerful. You're so right. I really believe uh, and resonate with what you're saying, because I have actually uh, interviewed a few uh, dating coaches uh, the last year and uh, and there are many dating coaches out there, but they're talking about the same. Uh, letting also, or for the woman also to realize that she's a woman, like I don't have to act like a man. And that had been uh, actually something I've been struggling with because in Scandinavia, women are very equal to men, like we've come so far, but we have this tendency of... Uh, almost being a bit too masculine and so independent like we don't need the men anymore almost and then we've sort of lost our femininity so for many of us we have to open up to our feminine side again and sort of yeah move into that divine feminine power that we have and that we've forgotten a bit um well there's a difference and this is something that my business coach has actually worked with me because when you have overcome a lot, when you've been through a lot, you have a tendency to think like a man and, and operate in that testosterone neural pathway. So when you do that, you lose what your needs are being met. And if you chose to come in here as a female, 
the perfect balance, you know, the infinity symbol that is the elongated A, the perfect balance is I'm both male and female. And I know how I'm male and I know how I'm female and I embrace them both. I'm not rejecting one. I'm not separating, cutting myself off, pretending, you know, sometimes I'll tell clients, why'd you cut off your right, your right hand? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, your right hand hurts all the time. It's as if you've cut it off. You're trying to operate, trying to pick up something with a hand that you have energetically cut off. And they're like, wow, my right hand does hurt all the time. After that session, their right hand no longer hurts and they learn how to use it in collaboration. That is very much what I'm doing in these book series to women, helping them to understand, be use testosterone, use dopamine. And then I do that work with my clients and they don't even know I'm doing it. Where if I see them feeling too much, I'll move them into a goal orientation, which is testosterone where you don't feel. So the problem is if we're emulating men all the time in testosterone, you know, using that vibration and that energy, we're not feeling. Well, when we came in here to feel, we are cutting a piece of ourselves off and we're not whole. My job is to get people to become as whole as they want to be unseparated, unfragmented, so that they can use everything to present themselves, in this case, to a man and say, naked, here I am. See who I am. And if it's a fit for you, come to me. If it's not, run, little boy. Right. And, and daring to be that vulnerable. Yes. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. That's not what I've been taught. And when I learned that vulnerability is a strength, that's where we need to go, or at least I need to go. Uh, wow, that was such a difference that I could be me. <laughs> I loved how you paint that picture. Like, this is me. And if it's not for you, then go. Like a little, yeah. little guy. I'm good, with that. I'm good if you stay. I'm good if you go. Beautiful. Teach me what I need to know. That's the reason I'm dating so much. Teach me what I need to know. You're such a brave woman. Uh <laughs> <laughs> right? They're like, why do you date so much? I said, intimate relationships is the highest form of growth. Why would I not do this? I know. And I, I need to get out there as well. Good. <laughs> I hope that encourages you. <laughs> you can learn from it. We can use it. You, I they're know. Again, I know. As, as idiotic as they are sometimes, like the sky last night. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know that energy. I know. I think I'm protecting myself from all that. Uh, or I know avoidance. I am. I know. Avoidance. avoidance. Oh my goodness. Your class is so powerful. And we've been sharing really personal today. Uh, and that feels good. Vulnerable, vulnerable. Vulnerability is a strength. And um, I really hope that everybody who is watching also got great value out of this and got inspired. I always get inspired by you, Tammy. So thank you so much for your beautiful mass class for showing up today. And I'm excited about your books and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste to everyone. Namaste.